Hi and welcome to um, Searching Together, who we do this Bible study in our house group um, in Yanchep, and sometimes we go down to King Ross. And um, I wanted to just get on to Galatians 5 today. In Galatians, Paul's been doing a defence of um, the gospel, really, the gospel of grace that causes us to freely receive uh, the, the gift uh, from God, the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's given freely to anyone who will come and um, and see that that's the, the thing that God wants us to, to go for. I'm just going to pray. Lord, we thank you for that grace. We thank you for the free gift. We thank you for the promise. We thank you that in Jesus we have eternal life. And we thank you that you are our King and our Lord and our God. And Lord, as we go into this time now of um, looking at what it actually is to walk this stuff out, help us, Lord, to be uh, diligently aware that you uh, want us to walk well, and you, um, but you have got grace if we don't. But Lord, help us to position ourselves for a good walk, for um, a, a robust appreciation of your holiness and your graciousness and your mercy and the, exactly what you've done for us in causing us to be uh, call ourselves believers today. Help us to walk well and bless me as I give this, that some of it will stick in Jesus' name. All right. So as I was saying, the grace and mercy afforded is as a free gift. That gets challenged when some people go around saying, hey, here's what's happening. You've got to become, you know, like Jewish. You've got to honour the Jewish rituals to be able to walk in that grace, to be qualified for that grace. You first have to go through the law. So Paul's, well, he's, he's had to defend himself as well because people are bringing him down, calling him inauthentic, all the kind of thing you'd expect from people who are trying to um, undermine Paul's ministry and cause, you know, um, false teaching to occur. Paul's extremely strong on this. Um, he's very, very angry and he's very, very um, keen to get the point across that there are, there are many different reasons why um, this isn't true. Reason number one experiential, did you actually experience this? Did you go through the law when you first became a Christian and experienced his grace? Answer, no, you didn't. Secondly, doctrinal. The Bible tells us um, that there was uh, Abraham was given a promise and he believed that promise and that belief, that faith in the promise was credited to him as righteousness. Um, the promise about many nations becoming, um, you know, coming to the Lord is actually fulfilled in Christ himself. So there's a connection there. And then the promise from that for someone to come to Christ is believing by faith in the promise uh, that Jesus Christ will take away um, your sins and you'll have eternal life in Jesus. That's what it is. So what do we do with the law? Well, you have to go back a couple of times to really, um, a couple of the other teachings to really, you know, nail that one. And what it is, is the law wasn't there to be a change of plan. It wasn't there to be something to derail the actual mechanism of salvation and faith in God. But it was there to um, cause us like a nanny, like a school teacher, to bring us to Christ, to, um, to show Israel that sin is real and to contrast sin so that they could have a real knowledge that, um, that they are tran transgressing before God and therefore need something more than a rule book that they can't keep. And that's where they put their faith in God. And they had rituals such as Yom Kippur. We mentioned that the two goats and the um, regular things of Passover. And we have, they have Sabbat. So there was many, many reminders to stay close to God, to walk with God for Israel. And, uh, but what does it mean for us today? We come to Christ through faith um, in the promise of Jesus taking away our sins and the, the finished work at Calvary. So um, what I want to do is I want to start at... Uh, Gal Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 and I'm going to read 15 verses so if you'll just bear with me as I do that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery mark my words I Paul tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised Christ will be of no value to you at all again I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is required to obey the whole law you who are trying to be justified by a law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await, through the Spirit, the righteousness from which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uns uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come for the one who calls you. 
A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go and go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law, entire law can be summed up in a simple command, love your neighbour as yourself. But if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. I'm going to leave it there because the next bit um, is going to be a series of teaching about walking well. Actually, what's going to be the component, uh, how do we know when we're walking well, what happens, you know, not walking well, all that. We'll get onto that next week. But what I want you to do is just pull out a few points. Um, so there's talking about a falling away from Christ. You were falling away from grace, verse 6, uh, for, sorry, verse 4. Um, and I want you to just talk about that a little bit because... You can't fall away from something that you weren't part of. So what this is, he's talking to Christians. These are Christians in the Galatian churches, and they're people who are true believers. Paul probably was there converting some of them in the beginning, and then now they're going on to something else. They're being diverted, distracted, uh, persuaded to go down another path. And that's like a falling away from the walk of grace. So, so grace brings you to jesus all right the grace of god will bring you to a saving knowledge of christ you'll be able to observe um, the the, the uh, sacrifice and the cross the atoning sacrifice the replacement that jesus took your uh, sin and shame and regret and he um and he gives you his righteousness so you stand here sit here as the righteousness of god it's a swap and he becomes your unrighteousness unrighteousness and wretchedness um, on the cross like that that's the initial grace but grace is an ongoing mechanism for relationship with jesus grace is when we know some people said god's riches at christ's expense i think that's really good but moving on from there whatever jesus got for you at the cross that's given on a daily basis so we have to walk in the grace we have to walk in the grace that the free gift from God is a daily transaction, not just a one-off event. So really to access God and all that, it's an act of grace. Ongoing mechanism for relationship with Jesus. So you can fall away from that when something gets in the way of you accessing God and that grace, divine favour. And as Galatians has been screaming out through the last four chapters, that any, any level of works, any level of you leaning in to try and do something yourself, spoils that grace god loves to lavishly give he loves to pour down and chase you down to bless you and give you a great thing even if it's in rebuke he's blessing you he's treating you like a child that's the highest calling ever just to be treated like a child but if anything gets in the way and we start to step up and do things now it, it talks a lot about the jews and it talks a lot about the Jews being under law specifically but we also talked about living under the basic principles of this world and really taking on like even churches, I mentioned it before in this in this series, uh, even churches that tell you that continued uh, coming to discipleship groups all the time or Bible studies or attending all the time. You now, zeal might do that, and that's not a bad thing. But if it becomes that them things are overtaking, the very fact that in and of yourself, before your head comes off the pillow in the morning, God's grace is upon you. And his favour is upon you and you can access that at any time. And it's a free gift from God. Isn't that beautiful? We can pray to God. That's an act of grace. We can walk with God. We can have joy and peace and love. And we're going to talk about the fruits of the Spirit later. All of these things given by God's grace. And then when we get into things like they were doing, teachings that make us need to go and qualify ourselves by outward signs and ritualistic things and things that we think are, um, um, are going to please God in the sense that to qualify us, it's not going to happen. You're daily qualified by ongoing mechanism of grace in the relationship with Jesus. And with that relationship, that's where we need to be sat. And we'll see that soon. Uh, next couple of studies, walking in the spirit is where we need to be preparing ourselves on a daily basis and throwing off what hinders. That was part of what we looked at. All the things that um, are going to be 
contrary to, to walking in the Spirit. So my heart for you guys, whoever's listening to this actually, is that you get freedom in Christ. I'm working on it for me just to identify and be able to move away from some of the things that, um, that are not helpful at all. Um, the, the law diverts from grace and relies on prescriptive ritual to meet God's so-called demands. So I'm going to say that again. Law diverts from grace. This is the, the law for, for the Jews. Diverts from grace and relies on prescriptive ritual rituals to meet God's so-called demands. I'll read it for the Gentile. Our religious efforts diverts from grace and relies on religion, religious efforts to meet God's so-called demands. Anything that you think you have to do to qualify yourself for salvation or qualify yourself for a good walk is just simply falling away from grace and you'll find yourself in God, oh God, I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit's good and he'll come and convict you and he'll come and get you out of that stuff. And um, I always give the illustration of when I used to, I think I read somewhere that, I don't know, someone said in a book somewhere, years and years ago when I first got saved, that David, you know, get up and read the Psalms. And you know, I think, did David say, I'm up at sunrise? So I tried it, got up at sunrise. And um, that went for a few days and, and it was good. It was sweet and I loved it. And I, f I felt really like a really good Christian for doing it. And um, and then a few days later, I started to, to fall asleep and then not get up. And then I felt like a bad Christian. Can you see what happens there? I've put something in my life to be a litmus test on whether I'm a good or a bad Christian. And it says it in a different way down here. Um, circumcision or uncircumcision is of no value. So me getting up and trying to do a Bible study at day break is a good thing on paper, unless the tail wags the dog. And I'm doing that to think, oh, I'm a good Christian now because I'm doing that. Or if I don't do it, then I've failed somehow. Because I've put something in the way. Can you see that? Can you see how that's possible? Am I saying don't get up early and pray and, and seek God? No. I'm just saying that make it spirit-led. Make it something that before you've done that discipline and done that thing that you feel would be a good thing for you, behind it is the grace already that tells you, no, you're not a good Christian. Christ is good on your behalf. And that grace has been afforded you. And the righteousness of God is upon you. You've become wrapped up in his righteousness. And that's the grace that happens before you even have an attempt to walk into anything that's going to cause hindrances like that. And on that basis, and on a regular reminder of what justification is, you know, the legal, um, the legal judgment on your life when you receive Christ, that you are the righteousness of God, you're adopted by God as his son, you are marked as an heir, you are got eternal life. Uh, there's things to work out, but none of that first stuff I just mentioned is is abrogated by the fact that sorry is um, is um, stopping the 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 grace that's on your life. Uh, we may be in a cul-de-sac of sin. You may be going through a sanctification process. You may be going through something which is painful, hard, and difficult, but it doesn't take away from the the good things. Circumcision has no value. Uncircumcision doesn't. If you do it. Well, that's something that you might want to do. If you don't do it, it but don't get circumcised. Because if you do, you've got, to, you've got to obey the whole law. If you're going to make a decision like that, okay? So the Jews have a lot to put, um, to kind of, um, uh, to cope with, with the baggage of the law. Um, the Lord's divine favour equals grace. Grace is the landing strip for faith. Listen, grace enters you into a race you didn't qualify. And I want to just focus on this. Verse 7, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this today because it's a pre it's a pre thing for going on to the next one, which will be the, the, the DNA of sanctification. Okay. Verse 7, 5, 7. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? Galatians 5, 7. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? Now, Paul uses this idea of a race quite extensively in his writings. And um, there's a couple of uh, ways that he's used it. I'm just going to get into um, 2 Timothy 2.5. 2 Timothy 2.5. 2 Similarly, if anyone completes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Right, that's just another 
running, an athlete kind of thing, a competition kind of thing. I'm going to try and grab Hebrews 12.1, just in a second, where I can find Hebrews. Where are you? Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 1. <clears throat> Therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So Paul's got this theme, hasn't he? Um, I'm going to try, um, what are we, 2 Timothy 4, 7, back into 2 Timothy 4, 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7. Um, I have fought the fight, the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Faith. Uh, I've finished the race. So he's on about this race quite a bit. And um and Acts 20, 24, Paul talks to the Ephesian elders and he has this theme of running a race. Again, so what's he talking about? So I think when we're running a race, he wants us to just keep running. And and I've got about I've got a few points here about how to run that race. And one of the things to consider when we're running a race, number one. Are you willing to run the race? The thing is, is that when you run a race, any race, there's going to be some fatigue. There's going to be some kind of things that happen to you. You've got to be up to run the race. And I'm challenging myself and I'm challenging everyone to say, really, are you running the race? Are you still in this race? And what the race is, is to just keep on keeping on. Walking in the spirit, which we'll do next week and the week after, possibly. And um, probably by the end of the, end of the, um, the letter by then. But are you willing to run? And that willingness comes from, oh, you know, it, and I think the key to it is, is to assess the prize and just to say, what is it, what are we going to get? Our eternal life's guaranteed, but there are rewards um, which are, you know, into the into the DNA of the, of the finish of the race. So if you stay faithful to the Lord and you say, you know, I'm going to run this race, I'm going to keep on keeping on, then that's something that's going to be really good. And you'll find the Lord gets alongside you and he starts to really help with the whole DNA of running that race. So um, are you willing to run is the first question. Are you willing to lean into your Christianity? Are you willing to take on board the daily task of saying, God, I want to I want to walk well. I want to be in you. I want to walk with you. I want to be faithful in you. I want to, as far as it's possible, to walk in the spirit, to be able to cast off the sin that so easily entangles, as it says in uh, Hebrews 12, 1. Casting off the things that stop you and doing all that. Second one, endurance. endurance. Um, well, don't give up. That's the thing. Don't give up. Whatever comes your way. Um, this is not a quick 100 metre sprint. This is a marathon. And you were going to be going at it for some time. Don't give up. God's with you. God's your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He will give you it daily, even in the lowest trough of, um, of difficulty and the slough of despond, God wants to bless you and he wants to give you a, um, a prize at the end of it for competing and he wants you to uh, to run the race. I was at cross country in school and um, it was absolutely bleak. Oldham, where I went to school, is on, um, it's called Oldham Edge and it's high up, Oldham's high up anyway. It's near, nearly on the moors, the Pennines. In fact, I think it is on the, in the Pennines, the lower Pennines. And uh, they used to get us to run around in shorts and a t-shirt. And I'm just not a runner. I don't even really noticed. Um, I just not, I'm just not a sports person like that in that way. But we used to go there. Plus, in the um, the the wisdom that I had, I decided to start smoking at the age of 13. Okay, I was smoking cigarettes. And um, then they'd ask us to run. And it was so cold sometimes. I cannot describe how cold it was. Some of the guys from wealthier families used to have this stuff that they used to put on the legs and it stunk. And this, uh, that kept them warm or did something, I don't know. And uh, we had some pretty good athletes in there. And I always came last-ish. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, it wasn't pleasant and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes I'd just, you'd see me bent over, probably vomiting a little bit because I'm a smoker and not fit, not really cut out for this kind of thing. And um, so that's a running race. But in this endurance, it's the endurance of faith that carries on. It's the endurance of, of keeping on, keeping on in your faith. As we said, willingness to run. I, do you want to? And if you do want to, this is a marathon. And, um, you know, it, it's not an unpleasant thing. We walk well in the Lord and we can have sweet fellowship with Jesus as we're doing it. Um, hindering, you know, throwing off things that hindered. Well, it would have been better if I stopped smoking for those marathon, uh, for those um, cross-country events. But I didn't and I just carried on doing what I was doing because I'm su such a wise man. Such a wise kid, you know, not really. Um, 
So run light, you know, throw off things, the heavy weights, the sins that, that hinders, it says in, uh, we've just seen in Hebrews 12, 1. Uh, have you ever seen modern trainers? You can pay a lot for trainers these days, training shoes, runners or whatever you're going to call them. And this, the light is a feather, you can pick them up, they hardly weigh a thing. And I think the idea is that you, you, you take as much weight off the, you know, if you're going to do it professionally and you're going to do it really, you know, to a top standard, you're going to have to be thinking about what you're carrying with you. Lightweight shirts, lightweight, you know, clothes, uh, the trainers that you wear, you're going to have to get some money spent on it because you're going to have to have some pretty light stuff to make it all work for yourself. Throwing things off, heavy weights, sin, hindrances, you know, on a daily basis, just... You know, whatever your, your dark museum is, whatever you know are your frailties and your weaknesses and all that, don't go to that place if you're tempted. Don't look at that thing if it's going to bring you down. Don't, you know, um, you know, feed into gossip and, and, you know, if you're prone to that kind of thing or lying or, you know, cheating or whatever your thing is, you know, just resolve yourself that you're going to walk in the spirit. Um... I'm just going to say the, say the first verse of next week. Live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. I'm going to unpack that. But I do believe that it's a lot easier to keep the temptation, uh, the gratification of temptation levels down when you uh, decide to walk by the Spirit and, and throw, throw things off. That's one, two, three. Willingness to run. Endurance. Don't give up. Don't be like me, smoking on a cross-country run at 13. Uh, run light. Um, modern trainers will help you do that. Number four, mental focus. And that's simply make Jesus your number one priority. Now, I know, because people have told me in our small fellowship that we have, is that um, some some things distract people and some th things are just, you know, they're just things that they want people, you, you want to do. Nothing wrong with, a, with, some, with having something as long as the, the something hasn't got you. And they say that about money, that's the one about money. It's all right having money, as long as the money's not got you. And um, it's all right having this hobby, as long as, as long as the hobby's not got you. And it gets in the way of Jesus being your number one priority. What, how, what does that mean? What does it actually mean? It's just a catchphrase, Jesus is your number one priority. Well, it means that you're praying Jesus into everything. You're saying to Jesus, all things, you know, and... Um, you know, what do I, you, you know, what do I, what do you want me to do this weekend, Lord? What do you want me to avoid? Guide me, Lord. Shape me. Bring me into um, a walking, talking relationship with yourself. And um, that's my desire to, to really do that. And I want to aim for that. But sometimes I get distracted and I get um, sort of like taken to one side and, and I find out things that I like and things that I get involved in very easily. And, um, and I find out very quickly that I'm not thinking straight about God again. I'm wondering where he's gone. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go, oh, well, this feels different. And then I'm complaining to God because he's gone somewhere. That's not how it works. We get easily uh, taken up by our, um, the stuff of the things of, of earth. Uh, Rich Mullins wrote an, wrote an album called um, The Things of Heaven and the Stuff of Earth. And I thought that was a great title because that's the battle isn't it? Every single day, the things of heaven versus the stuff of earth. And we've got to learn to detach ourselves. Again, you can get into works with that legalism, fear, trying to just, you know, oh, I'm scared of, you know, even you know, what happens if I have some, um, you know, pork chops and, I, and, and, you know, God's not pleased with me. I don't know. That's a bad example, maybe. I love pork chops. I've got some over there. That's why I said it. Um, but doing things through fear and all that, that's it going the other way, going too far. But we've just got to um, make Jesus our number one priority and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And that really would be a scripture, which I can't remember where it's from now, but it's there somewhere. Um, number five, examples of fellow athletes. All right, so Hebrews 11 um, is the one before, you know, the, the Hebrews 12 verse, and this is what, it, what it's saying. You know, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, um, unfortunately, it's not the people who've passed on watching you. That's just creepy. Uh, that's not what it's saying. The great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, verse 1, is the people in verse, in chapter 11, the hall of faith. All the um, the, the people who, you, who are listed there, and there's more, but just the ones who are listed there, who have run the race. And there's some real characters in there. You know, these are the fellow athletes. These are the ones who've ran the race. And we've got we've got stories in there. So if you're ever stuck for examples, well, how can I have an example of somebody who, 
ran the race and there's your list you've got like a bible study what you can do on your own there of hebrews 11 um there's many failing people in that list many failing people so if you ever feel like you're failing i'm prone to be beat myself up and to be harsh on myself but i have to remember god does not mention sin in that chapter he's not mentioned that he's saying no by faith by faith these people did this by faith they did this by faith he she did this and that's the point of the verse god's interested in your faithfulness what are you going to believe about it today what you're going to think about all of this um um all of the the examples of people have gone by what are you going to do um are you going to study them are you going to look at what they did and it'll turn out that through the tripping and the falling and the stumbling and the walking into brick walls and the foolishness and you know you know we're even talking king david here you know the the great moral um dysfunction that he encountered um is a situation where he still gets a mention in the hall of faith god is looking for faithfulness and he has forgiven your sins through jesus um number six trials are for your training Tr trials are to get us into being a good runner if you um want to do a race a literal race in an, as an athlete then you're going to have to put it you know you have to run up steps and you're going to have to run up the side of a side of a mountain maybe to get your stamina to get your endurance to get everything in place so that when it comes to that race you are a machine that can really do that and we sometimes think that when we've got trials, that that means that we've done something wrong, we're in God's bad books, this is a, a travesty of my faith, it's all going wrong, oh my goodness Lord, where are you? And all of this is to stretch us, so that we will be faithful runners, and we'll be faithful people who will stick with Jesus as number one. So, number one, willingness to run. Number two, endurance, don't give up. Number three, run light, throw off heavy weights, sin, hindrances. Number four, mental focus, make Jesus your number one priority. Number five, examples of fellow athletes, Hebrews 11. We've got data in the Bible, I've got a Bible here by the way, in the Bible of what it's like to be faithful and what it's like to fall off flat on your face and get up again to carry your own cross. Trials are your training, number six. Trials are your training. Never forget that. God wants you to succeed, but he wants you to be have the, the metal, the backbone, the stamina, the endurance to be able to do so. And that takes trials. Number seven, a desire to win. Winning me means walking well in faithfulness daily, um, but have that desire and culture that desire to win and to get, you know, get running this race of faithfulness. So, when we have an eternity that's promised to us, let's be sure that we know what that's around. There was an illustration some preacher did a while ago, and he had this small amount of rope, this red piece of rope, and then he had this rope right across the auditorium, like metres and metres and metres. And he said, why is it that we will give up the, the eternity, the, the never-ending um, promise of rewards, eternal rewards and bliss and, and the presence of God daily, and for this small amount called life, you know, and um, what we need to do is orientate ourselves around that in light of the rest of it, not the other way around. So what we do is we look at the life that we've got now and, and, and position and posture ourselves for the win. And that means to walk daily in faithfulness and, um, you know, walking in a, in a place where we do daily have our devotionals and we're getting them. Number four, don't get cut in on false teachers everywhere. Um, there's churches that are teaching the wrong thing. Actually, there's a cult in Perth at the moment. I went to speak to these students about it the other day to try and free them up from this cult. They asked me to do it. They got in touch with me, an ex-student that I knew from Alter One. And um, I went and met them and I gave them three strategies. Don't go to the cult. This is just sounds simple. Number two, um, get yourself some good Bible teaching. I recommended some people to them. And then number three, get planted in a good church with a good reputation. And that's the way that you, and that's just advice to everybody, especially people who have been uh, subject to false teaching. And then find out, ask people who are preaching the right stuff, whether this is false teaching, if you're hearing something and it sounds a bit, um, sounds a bit dodgy. Um, we've got the spirit of discernment, so the gift of discernment, and we can usually get a check in our spirit if something isn't going well. So don't get cut in on. Um, Paul wants the false teachers to go further with their circumcision knife 
and cut off everything in that area. Um, Paul's not as polite as we are. He wants to. He wants you to go and emasculate themselves. As such is the anger that he's got to all these people who have uh, perverted the gospel. Um, just, just don't stop. Just carry on. Cut it all off. Um, so, verse thirteen. Let me just find that. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Called to be free. He wants your freedom. He's jealous for your freedom. He's jealous for your faithfulness. He's jealous that you don't get wrapped up in works or any kind of, um, you know, spiritual principles of this age. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I want to get into next week and I'm going to do a little bit of um, um, 16 uh, to possibly, uh, let's maybe 6, 10, I'm not sure. Let's see how it, how it works. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you desire freedom for us. You desire us to walk well. You desire us to, to attain to the prize, to attain to the, um, the reward that you've got for us and what's coming. And we know Jesus is our reward. Sweet Jesus, as we go into the um, Passover, into the um, eternity, Lord, that he will be there. And, um, and that's enough reward. We, but you've got more because grace doesn't end there. You've freely favoured us, Lord, not just in this life, but in eternity. Help us to walk well in the light of that. In Jesus' name. Amen.